having me here today. It's, a, it's an honor given that I'm not a medical professional, I'm just a pilot and a professor at MIT. And when I tell you that, and then you see me here, and you see me in this dress and these heels and this hair, you think, fighter pilot, really? How is that possible? And I want to tell you, what did I love most about being a fighter pilot? I loved dropping bombs. I loved strafing targets. 3,000 rounds per minute, you can't beat that. And I love landing on aircraft carriers. But as much as I love that, it was very difficult. I was one of the first female fighter pilots. There was a lot of social upheaval when I was inserted into that situation. The best way I can explain it to you is that uh, the story where I went to the bar one night after a flight with some of the pilots, and one of the older pilots said to me, you know, I know it's not politically correct, but I really don't want to fly with women. Because if you can do what I do, if you can drop bombs and strafe targets as good as I can, what does that make me? And that was hard to hear, but I think that was a really important, somewhat inebriated statement he made to me. I don't think it would have been that truthful in real life, but it was important because it helped me understand the struggle, not only there, but in my career now. So I want to tell you a little bit more about one of the things that happened to me when I was flying that motivated me to go, to go into research. So when I was flying F-18s, there were two things, two technologies that I witnessed that made me understand that the heyday of the fighter pilot was over. The picture that you're seeing at the top is an F-18 landing on an aircraft carrier and this fantastic shot of behind an aircraft carrier. Well, it turns out that there's this thing in F-18s called the mode one approach where the plane, pretty much you hit a button and it lands itself. Not only does it land itself by itself on the aircraft carrier, it always does a better job than the pilot. It is always more consistent, it is always more precise. And that event, coupled with the little missile that you're seeing at the bottom of the screen, that's a Tomahawk missile. That is a missile that it can be launched from any ship, a submarine, from a thousand miles from its intended point of target, and it always hits its target within a meter, always. There is no fighter pilot, bomber pilot, Air Force, Navy, wherever, that can always hit a target within a meter. So when I was flying and I saw these two technologies, which at the time were separate, this was about 20 years ago, and I said to myself, if that plane can land itself and, it can, and we can shoot weapons that always do better, what does that make me? And so I kind of, it came full circle that I understood that technology was changing my life. And combined with the social upheaval, I decided to jump ship at that time and go into research. And this is the research that I do. It's called human supervisory control, where you have a human trying to do some task, in this case, fly an unmanned aerial vehicle through a computer. So you're not really flying the UAV. You're really just kind of encouraging it along. And where do we see other applications of human supervisory control? Robotic forklifts. This is a project that we are working on for the U.S. Army, where we are able to take robotic forklifts that go into fields, deserts, forests, and make warehouses where none have existed. And we are seeing high-speed rail. We do a lot of research in Europe trying to help operators supervise high-speed trains. They're not controlling it anymore. But you see it in other places near and dear to your own heart, the da Vinci robotic surgery. This is an up-and-coming technology, which many of you are familiar with, but we'll talk about some advances in a few minutes. And then last but not least, coming to a road near you, especially if you're in Nevada, the Google car, which actually of all these technologies scares me the most. It's not that I don't trust the robot driving, I just don't trust everybody else on the road around the robot driving. So let me explain to you uh, one of the, the projects that we had that really caused way more social upheaval than I ever thought possible, and it was the one that really put my lab, the Humans and Automation Lab, on the map. By the way, there was a little joke in there, but you have to be over the age of 40, I have found out, to get the joke behind the name of my lab, so those young people in the crowd go ask the older people. Uh, so we, my students really wanted to do, we were doing UAV control and they really wanted to use an iPhone, so eventually I gave in and uh, we designed this UAV, it's a little small quad rotor UAV and you'll see it fly here in a second. And what we did is we distilled an entire cockpit down into your iPhone. I don't want to be Apple biased, it works on any smartphone. But you can, you actually tilt it and move it and the vehicle moves according to the gestures effectively that you're putting in. And to show just how effective this was, we took this to a university out west, and we set up on this field, and that's what you're seeing in the larger picture with the, with the yellow frame. You're seeing the, the camera shot of what's going on on the field in the upper uh, 
right corner, you're seeing what the camera view is. You're going to see what the people are looking for. And then what you see is you're going to see a picture of a person come into view because they had to go find a person. And then you're going to see a Snellen chart come into view because we wanted to see what kind of visual acuity you could get using one of these flying robots with an iPhone. Whoever thought you could have so much fun with the Snellen chart? And then at the bottom, you'll see a person. You'll see their movements of their hands. And we literally went around the field, and we just grabbed people walking by and had them come participate in our experiment. And they were given three, just three minutes of training. And that allowed them to take the aircraft off, go find these targets, and then land it successfully. So let me show you what that looks like. Okay, now, uh, why was that such a big deal? Well, it's because we distilled the job of a pilot, which is, in the past, took many years of training. It takes more than a million dollars to train a fighter pilot. And somehow, we have now distilled that skill set into an iPhone, where literally anyone in this room, I could take any of you to, uh, to, and fly this vehicle today. And you would not believe the hate mail that I got, the hate email, rather, I got from military and commercial pilots who were very resentful that I was somehow trivializing their task. And, you know, it really made me flash back to that time where I was a fighter pilot to realize, yes, what does that make me? Now, not only is it women that can fly these things, but anyone in this room can fly these things. And that really, you know, it kind of hurts, you know, as a, as a former fighter pilot, you know, it, it's hard because, you know, landing on an aircraft carrier makes me better than almost anybody in the planet, especially Air Force pilots. I mean, that's what the Navy trains us, and now anyone can do it, right? And the computer can do it better. But what it, it, and I think that we're starting to sense it's kind of a John Henry fear of replacement. But I, my message to you today is automation, computer software, and technology, it's really not about replacement, especially for these, these worlds that we live in, these complex systems. It's about redefining the role. And here, the, I want to explain to you this SRK taxonomy to help understand what does it mean to have our role redefined as automation. It's the skill, rule, knowledge-based taxonomy by Jens Rasmussen. And I propose that this is what leads us to expertise. And if you understand, for example, that skills, what are skills? This is a cockpit. A pilot spends a lot of time, hours and hours and hours, thousands and thousands of dollars learning to keep the aircraft steady, the wings stable. We call it, you know, houses get bigger, houses get smaller. You want to keep the aircraft in stable flight. But this, and this is a skill. It's a skill we spend a lot of time on. But it turns out that automation can do this skill just as better, if not better, than we can. Why? Because it requires a lot of precision, a lot of repeatability. And many of you know in this room, there's something called a neuromuscular lag, which, in effect, if something happens in our world in a cockpit, it takes about a half a second, at best, for a human to respond to that. Automation doesn't have a neuromuscular lag, so it turns out that this is why unmanned aerial vehicles are so popular today and doing a fantastic job, because they don't have the neuromuscular lag, nor do they have to go to the bathroom, nor do they whine about flight pay. So, uh, so that's skill-based skill reasoning. Let's go to knowledge-based reasoning, which is the next, a little bit higher up. These are behaviors that you exhibit in your world. Knowledge-based reasoning, we can in the aviation world, there are procedures. And oh, by the way, procedures are really up and coming in the medical world as well. There are sets of rules, given some state that we observe, and then we do an if-then-else algorithm to figure out what to do next. Well, anytime you say, I've got an if-then-else algorithm, you can generally encode that into some kind of computer software. And we're not quite there yet. There is still, obviously, a sets of rules and, and observations that we need in the world that we can't automate. But we're being able to automate rule-based rule behaviors every day more and more. And lastly, the behavior that we see up here is knowledge-based behavior. These are where, this is required when humans are faced with a lot of uncertainty, where you have to rely on your judgment and your experience. There, there are variables in the world that could not be accounted for in an algorithm, so we've got to figure out, we've got to make a best guess. This is the domain where humans really reign supreme. We are excellent, far better than automation, and will be for a long time at making best guesses, given a lot of uncertainty in the world. And in fact, we need teams, teams of people to come together. In the future, you won't need pilots near as much as you're going to need a very talented air traffic controllers who can both command the planes to go where they want to, as well as doing deconfliction. Now, let me explain to you about the medical world. How do these uh, behaviors relate. Well, first of all, for skill-based behavior, we've seen Da Vinci, but Yoav Madan was here last year to tell you about uh, ablative tumor 
surgery with the push of a button. And any time you, you talk about push of a button, you're going to reduce the skill set down to automation. But even in rule-based procedures, again, we're seeing this in the automation world. I want to tell you about a new technology that the government is designing. It's an automated critical care system that does uh, mechanical ventilation, fluid and drug therapy, supplemental oxygen, all at the push of a button. So you just you hook somebody up to it, you push the buttons, and you walk away. Now, we're not replacing medical professionals as much as we're offloading a lower set of skills and rule-based behaviors to allow the, them the freedom to move along to more important jobs like trauma. Now, another uh, research project that the military's got going underway, which I think you will find very interesting, is a robotic helicopter, which is operated by, let's say, a medic on the ground. The medic has an iPhone pushes the button, this robotic helicopter comes and finds this person, finds its own landing site, finds its own way there, lands, has one of these critical care systems in it. We stick a wounded soldier who maybe had a bullet to the chest, and that helicopter by itself, and with that critical care system, whisks that person off to a trauma center where the teams of people, the teams of surgeons and nurses and what have you, are there to provide the knowledge-based reasoning to figure out what to do about this person. So we're really moving into a brave new world where we need to think more about knowledge, how to support human knowledge so that we can get to that expertise. But I'm here to kind of lecture, not you necessarily, but I'm uh, lecturing the technology developers. This is not the way to support knowledge. This is one of the problems that we see across all domains, medical domains, high-speed train control, power grid control, military control, you name it. This ground control, this uh, control station you see here, this is an actual picture from Afghanistan. This is one person's operator workstation. If you can see, there's six screens, four keyboards, several mice, and the most important display that you see here is a cowbell that the person needs to ring. Now, uh, what does it look like? That's the only way they can really get attention. So what does it look like in the medical world? This is the new and up and coming radiologist center. Looks remarkably similar. I will tell you that the big advancement made between the medical world and the aviation world is we've got to get down to one keyboard, which is great, except that we're pushing too much information. More information does not make people smarter. And so I'm here to kind of lecture the technology developers. We have to make sure that we understand how humans can work with technology. How do we design algorithms to work together with doctors so we can search better? We're doing this in the military world. We've got it down now that, that if an uh, operator will work with a uh, automation, we can actually search much better, much faster than we would if the human or the automation has searched alone. And that's the message I want to leave you with today, is that in the future, we're going to have to step away from the pilot or the doctor as the master of the technology and the technology the slave to the you know, uh, highly exalted, uh, exalted pilot or doctor. And we need to move more toward a mutually supportive, symbiotic, collaborative relationship where we will see that together the technology and the human will do so much more than we ever would have seen alone. Thank you.